just want to applaud you on your steadfast enthusiasm. Keep it up. Thank you. Um, I, I guess it's a very complicated issue, and yeah, trying to bring it into all war it seems like it uh, requires a, a, a complete re-understanding of all the pieces that lead people and governments and individuals to let all those little seeds get planted. Uh, redefining weaponry, pulling it off the shelves, uh, how, how does economic justice stand to keep populations happy with their lot as opposed to ending up with little pockets of terrorism and people who want more because they've had less for the last hundred years. Um, all that's interconnected, I believe. Uh, the first step, obviously, is is making war in general, the whole concept of war, illegal, um, amoral, and, and our whole concept of war is based upon the Great War, one and two. And right now, we have clandestine wars all over the world that are probably being funneled by our clandestine side of our government. Uh, you can look at the CIA and whoever knows what other organizations all over the world, they're all clandestine, and we're basically building weaponry for all that stuff, and until we can get a hold on all those little seeds, it's fine and dandy to sign our petitions and bring out numbers, but those are things that we can't affect until we can bring justice to all that clandestine operations and, and declare all that uh, amoral and illegal. So I guess my question is, is it's, a, it's a tall order and it's going to take a lot of steadfastness for a long, long time. And I guess I would like to see a little more um, aggressive energy toward dealing with all this clandestine stuff that's basically going on in front of, in front of us as well. And it, it's not as out in front and, and publicized. But, you know, you can look at history and, and where Iran was before uh, uh, we put the puppet in there years and years ago. And, and that was a great democracy that we basically assisted uh, Great Britain in tearing apart. And it was all done clandestinely. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, several questions there. I, I think when you hear from the humanitarian Western liberals who want to do away with war, what they'll tell you is that make these backward nations democracies because democracies don't go to war with each other. But the facts are that when poor nations try to be democracies, in at least 30 cases, the U.S. government goes in and overthrows that democracy. Right? And in many other cases, uh, has wrongfully and detrimentally influenced uh, the shape of foreign governments uh, in overt and covert ways. You look at what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, it's one example of many. The, a couple weeks ago, 33 Latin American nations declared a zone of peace and an absolute ban on war and the threat of war in Latin America. Now, they have a neighbor that wasn't part of that, uh, at whom that was directed quite clearly. Uh, but that is the sort of achievement that nations need to engage in. We need to recognize old treaties, create new ones, whatever works. Uh, we need to, to confront that. Um, you'll find as one of the... the I, I do wish I had gone through the, the hundred some steps uh, because others will be asked about, but one of the steps on World Beyond War that we think needs to be taken is the abolition of the CIA and, and every other clandestine agency, not their reform, not their return to their noble roots, but their abolition. And, and the abolition of the justification of secrecy that comes with war. It is, it is the wars and the idea that you have enemies that must not be told what your government is doing that is the primary excuse for the government not to tell the people who are supposedly its sovereigns what it's doing. Uh, and, and so if we do away with the idea of war, if we do away with generating enemies out of China or anybody else, then we do away with the primary justification for secrecy. You know, every time we have one of these wars for freedom, we end up with less freedom by the end of the war, quite predictably. They strip away our rights under the excuse uh, of protecting us. Uh, and of course, it's not protecting us from infringements on our freedoms. Nobody fantasizes that Iran is going to come take over Washington and start restricting our rights. You know, it isn't even on the on the radar. It's, it's supposedly it's protecting us from from being killed and raped. But uh, 
it, it, the end result, among others, is to strip away our rights and our freedoms under that excuse of war. Um, but I do, I, I, I do quibble with you know the idea that it's fine and dandy to sign petitions, but it won't do a damn bit of good and so forth because it because I see it do so much good all the time, and when uh, and when more people do it, it does more good, uh, and when you organize people into a, a community or an organization that can urge them on to stronger actions, we you know we have created a, a nonviolence action training committee in World Beyond War and are training people in nonviolent strategy and action, uh, then you can do yet more that isn't done by petitions alone. Um, so I, I think, you know, every, every good thing that was ever done was, was quite reasonably denounced as impossible right up until it was done. Um, and I, I would like at some point to be able to say, or if we last that long, for the next generation to be able to say, that, that, that war is one of those cases, too. Um, there, there are several. You need the microphone, so. Who's next? Thank you, David. That was a great talk. I'm Lisa Savage. I live in Solon, Maine. And um, I'm particularly always interested in the point about controlling the narrative. It may be because I have journalism interests of my own. Um, it may be because I was born in 1956, so I've been in that propaganda stream. I remember a Hercules cartoon when I was a child in the Cold War where the, the title song was, If You Want to Live in Peace, You've Got to Be Strong. Um, and also, it may be because I'm in touch with children a lot. I'm an educator, and so I see that Time Magazine is in the classroom. And the, the whole narrative of like violence is, you know, we're, we're always under threat, and violence is the only answer. Of, you know, a lot of people call the History Channel the Hitler Channel, because, you know, kids come into school going, well, World War II was where there was this terrible genocide, and, and uh, the Holocaust, and the U.S., you know, went in there and saved them, and when they find out, like, IBM profited from the Holocaust, and, sold the registration systems to the Nazi government and continued right on making money, they, you know, they're really shocked. Or if they see a film showing them like, do you know how much propaganda you've seen in your short life about how Arabs are always terrorists, always violent, and a threat to your safety? And these kids are like, oh my god, Aladdin? Even Disney? You know, even, they, they really don't know. And they're really surprised and, and pleased to find out. But as you know, Communications in our day are pretty controlled by corporations. You've done a ton of work to use the outlets that you have to communicate. The United States just plummeted to something like 53rd in press freedom in the annual survey of how reporters are feeling about. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more. My question is, could you talk a little bit more about what the people in this room could do to help occupy the narrative for uh, you know, against violence is always the solution. I'm pretty sure we are still at the top in the ability to chant USA, USA. Um, we, we are rather low in many other categories. Uh, and uh, countries that have less money than we have have better lifespans, better life expectancy, birth ex expectancy, uh, happiness, uh, retirement, vacations, lifestyles, uh, transportation, energy systems. Uh, it, it, there's a choice being made uh, between having bombers and billionaires or having all those other things that actually are, are part of protecting uh, and defending and supporting the people of this country. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen a video that Lisa and Mark made about the attitudes of some fans of guy named Barack Obama, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and when the Hillary video comes out, I think spreading it around uh, is something that will help people's understanding uh, tremendously. I think anyone who laughs and declares, we came, we saw he died at the killing of Gaddafi, which has left such chaos in that country that nobody talks about, uh, and who described the approach to Iran as potentially its obliteration um, needs to be treated 
honestly. Um, there's, there's also a book out this week that I've bought but not read yet called Operation Paperclip, uh, which, for those who don't know, um, and Bruce Gagnon can tell you all about the history of Operation Paperclip, um, but uh, many, many Nazi criminals and scientists were immediately hired by the United States and put to work developing chemical and biological weapons and torturing uh, Soviet spies and, uh, and generally infiltrating the American military mentality with Nazism. Uh, and and that, that part of the history, you know, never mind that the United States killed more people in Germany from the air than the Germans killed uh, in their camps, never mind that it was the continuation of the war that led to the continuation and escalation of the hostilities in the camps, never mind that the Western nations, including the United States, wouldn't allow any refugees to leave Germany uh, before the war, uh, never, never mind that it was known, it was well known what was happening there and it never became a part of the war propaganda until the war was over uh, and it didn't become the good war until we had bad war we needed to compare it with in order to preserve the standing of the institution of war. Um, people, people need to know that history and we need to work on better immediate communications, better schools, better education systems, uh, and, and raising children who understand that it's a choice, that you don't have to have war. Uh, you know, we, we teach our kids not to fight, to use words, and then we teach them that a justice system is brutal and violent, and a foreign relations system it, it leans on mass murder as its primary tool. And in the process, we teach our children in this and many other ways to accept stark contradictions and learn not to think them through. Uh, we, have to, we have to spread the idea of thinking things through and dropping views that cannot be made consistent uh, with other facts. And um, I, I, think, I, I think a great part of it is beginning to seize moments and opportunities to talk about Syria or Iran or China or wherever it might be uh, in terms of the wrongness of war in its entirety uh, and developing the strength and the ability to put the question of the institution itself on the agenda, which it won't be put there for us. Yes? Whoever gets the microphone. Hi, I'm Steve from Richmond. Uh, the question <clears throat> involves your opinion of the Christian right. And uh, I, I, I just have a, uh, the opinion that there's a crusade going on right now. Uh, it, it's happening in the 21st century. And uh, uh, it's very frightening for me to know uh, elected leaders are on the far right that support this, uh, if you may, some kind of a Christian, it's a Christian jihad going on, and, and your whole take on that. You know, a lot, it's become very common for people to speak against organized religion uh, because of the organization. I, I take the exact opposite approach. I'm for the organization and against religion. Um, and I, I say that with the understanding that many of our best peace activists and activists on, in other areas are religious and religiously motivated. And I don't want to lose that, you know. But I think there is much more bad than good. I think it's another way in which we're taught to, 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 to fail to think, to, to, to see our, our loved ones die and just tell ourselves over and over again, nobody dies, nobody dies, nobody dies, which contributes to the irrational, misguided habits of thought that allow our government to tell us Iran is a threat, Iran is a threat, Iran is a threat. We have to learn to think. 
You have to learn to look at facts and think. Um, so, that, you know, there are people doing wonderful, good things out of a Christian motivation and people doing horrible things out of a Christian motivation. There's a university started by Jerry Falwell called Liberty University down near my house where they have a drone school where they teach people, and they teach people online in active duty in foreign countries, in participating in war, uh, to kill for Jesus. To, uh, to kill people with missiles uh, from drone joysticks uh, for Jesus. Uh, and I interviewed a whole bunch of them and wrote an article in a, in a sort of liberal Christian uh, magazine called Sojourners. Um, and they, they allow atheists to write for them, I guess. And, uh, and I interviewed all of these students and some of the graduates and asked them about the moral question of killing people. Uh, at the push of a button. And I think more disturbing than any answer they could have given me was their absolute inability to understand the question. To understand that there was any question there at all. To see that there was anything... Because as soon as I said the word moral, they explained how they were against gays, and they were against abortion, and they were against Obama, and they, you know, these were, this is morality. Right? But when I repeatedly with the same person over and over again, what about the moral question of murdering people with missiles? No, can't understand it. Now, people who've done it, some of the people who've done it, understand it all too clearly and are near the point of suicide and the, and the post-traumatic stress disorder is higher for the drone pilots than for the, for the pilots who go up in a plane because they see the families for weeks and then kill them, watch them die. And they see that they've killed a child and they're told, no, no, that was a dog, and they know it's a lie. And, uh, and, and so they confront the morality, but they confront it too late, just like a public that turns against a war the next year when it's too late to stop it. Um, and I, I think that there is, uh, you know, and this is, of course, a university that's been a big pusher of Republican politics uh, and banned a Democratic Party club on campus because that was unacceptable and so forth. Um, there is this connection uh, between the military and right-wing politics and war uh, and Christianity. Uh, and there's a, there's a great organization working to get uh, religion out of the military, but it's an incredibly uphill fight uh, and it's very, very much a part of the military uh, and people who go to chaplains with their with their doubts and guilt uh, in military so-called service are very often given no help whatsoever that would allow them to question what they're doing. Um, and they're, they're, they're told that the non-Christians are enemies. Um, and that's the primary problem I have with with religion, with nationalism, with political parties, with any arbitrary group that creates outsiders. Uh, race, sex, ethnicity, language. We have to stop imagining that people who are different aren't quite people. And we do it as almost as a matter of principle. And then we engage in this ritual of undoing it in little bits. And say, oh, well, there I read this novel about some kids in Afghanistan and you know, it humanized them. What? Were they not human to begin with? Where does this conception come from that people who look different, talk different, worship a different God are somehow less than human until we learn that they have names and birthdays and loved ones and friends? Well, of course they do. Everybody does. You know, so at some point we have to, in a general sense, come to that basic understanding and stop having to come to it in little bits and pieces over and over again. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Barbara West, I'm with Women's International League for Peace and for You. And my, my question is about something that I think you probably just didn't have time to get to. Um, there's a long tradition in the peace movement internationally as well as here that says that there's no eliminating war without working for economic and political and social justice. And I wonder if you can comment in a brief way about that. Well, I think the two are very interrelated. Um, I think that unless we build a movement that takes on all such issues together, we aren't going to have the strength of numbers uh, to win on any of them. Um, I don't think, as a matter of physics or anthropology, uh, that it's actually true that you can't get rid of war without 
getting rid of capitalism. I, I mean, without getting rid of extreme corrupt capitalism or whatever you want to define the economic problem as. Uh, I think you can get rid of one and keep the other, get rid of the other and keep the first one. But I think we should get rid of both, uh, injustice economically and injustice in terms of mass organized violence. Uh, I think we're going to have an easier time getting rid of both together because we're going to have a bigger, broader movement to do it. I think the Occupy movement was a good start. You know, I, I think people who say, well, you know, we elected Barack Obama and we got it almost right, let's try a different one and maybe, no, I say we built the Occupy movement and it wasn't quite right, let's build a different one. You know, that's, that's what we need to try again, bigger and better. Uh, and it has to include uh, economic justice. Um, and they're interrelated in many ways, some of which I've touched on. I mean, funneling wealth to the 1% is a big part of what military spending does. Uh, and Wall Street and war profiteers are, a, are very two very overlapping categories. Um, and war is, is used to enforce injustice. Uh, and the militarization of local police and state police uh, and the dumping of our money into, into tanks and drones for local sheriff's departments uh, and the development of an approach to local residents in a town or a county in this country as sort of low-grade enemies in a war it is part of how militarism corrupts our culture, just as Eisenhower said it would. Um, and, and so I think we have to take on both. And, and so in a certain broad sense, yes, as long as we're willing to engage in all sorts of destruction, we're going to have war as well as environmental exploitation and human exploitation. But war is a heck of a lot older than capitalism. Uh, and you have countries with all sorts of degrees of economic exploitation and all sorts of degrees of militarism. And there's not really a correlation. Um, so uh, so I, I would say yes and no, I guess, uh, as an answer. And, and thank you for everything that your organization has done for years and years and years. Uh, I hope it keeps doing so. And I think you have a, an anniversary coming up just like World War I does, which we should celebrate rather than mourn. Who's next? Any questions? I don't have a question. I have a series of statements I'm going to make it for the next hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, one thing I want to say is that I'm a member of Veterans for Peace, and, and in 1985, when we formed Veterans for Peace, our defining principle was stated very clearly, was to abolish war. And of course, we were considered naive, um, and still are to some extent. So I'm proud to say that. Um, I'm also thinking what you're running off a whole different things that made me think of the Seville Statement in 1982, I think it was, about basically saying we, we are not hardwired to go to war, which was a wonderful statement. Scientists say it. Scientists say it, and absolutely, the UN supported it, actually. And then, you know, back to the 13th century, St. Augustine's, you know, the just war theory, which can be used uh, against the Christians who think war is fine, which is what he tried to do, is develop this whole idea that it's okay to, to kill your brothers and sisters as Christians. And he set up, like, I think of it, 18 different uh, principles that had to be met pre-war, during war, and post-war. And you could apply those to any war right now and stop wars cold, because none of them, none of them meet any of those principles at all. So that could be used, I think, along those lines. Um, another thing is we, we, we've held symposia on post-traumatic stress disorder for five or six years now, uh, and we're finally waking up um, to using moral injury as the real thing to look at, because PTSD has been co-opted by the military. Now the soldiers, you know, the soldiers are told they're going to get PTSD before they go into theaters. They have teams uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, in, going into the theater of war. Uh, working with people, saying, you've got PTSD, man. Well, you know, no kidding. Uh, so PTSD has been co-opted. We're working on moral injury now, which is a much more, I think, uh, realistic way of looking at the war. And my final rant uh, is, um, are you aware of Stephen, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, theory of dis, uh, um, punctuated disequilibrium, which is basically that evolution is not this gradual process, but is in fact these spurts 
things happening. And people are starting to apply that to the social sciences as well, and say, you know, uh, it's not like this. It's going to be a gradual process of finally getting rid of war. It could be. It could be done literally overnight. And I thought of the Occupy movement as exactly that. You know, it's just a spurt, and there it is. Okay, it's going to come again. It's going to come again. And maybe it'll tip the balance. So, what's my question? Um, I, I, I mean, it's a sort of metaphorical to apply uh, evolutionary science to uh, social movements, but I think that uh, it, it, it's accurate, and I think that uh, people need to understand how quickly it could come, uh, how quickly it appears to be beginning to come, uh, and stop being discouraged if it doesn't, uh, you know, because it, it, unless we're willing to put everything into it because it's the right thing to do, because we don't have a choice, because unlike our elected officials, we care about our grandchildren's kids. Uh, you know, if, if we're worried about whether we're succeeding and then we'll keep doing it with a smile or we're losing and then we'll go crawl under our beds and cry, then, you know, we're going to fail because nothing comes as quickly as people get themselves hoping for. But it, it is sometimes right around the corner and if we would work for it a little bit longer, uh, we would get it. I, I spoke in Portland years ago uh, at a church, I think. Some, some people here were there, and uh, I think we were trying to impeach a certain president at that point. Uh, and I went away telling everybody, this was the best place I've ever spoken for the absence of stupid, crazy rants, for intelligent questions, for polite and eager activists. And I, I, nothing today has changed that analysis for me. Um, I think uh, I think VFP is one of the best groups we have. I'm an associate member. Somebody bought me an associate membership, and then I had to keep renewing, of course. Um, and if I were to live up to Bruce Gagnon's introduction, I would rehearse for you George Carlin's analysis of the gradual movement from straightforward language like shell shock to to this antiseptic notion of post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, I can't, I can't do it with George Carlin's emphasis, but it, it, it's absolutely right. Uh, and it wipes out not just the violence, but the morality. Uh, and so to start looking at the guilt involved, the morality involved, which the chaplains, as a rule, seem to refuse to do when go, gone to as consultants uh, within the US military, that, that is very, very much needed. It's not all there is to it, uh, but it's it's a huge part that's that's missing. It's intentionally wiped out, um, and we have to we, we have to go there with it. One more quick uh, piece of information. I don't know if people are aware of it or not, but uh, uh, JROTC probably has. A um, number of uh, high schools in the state of Maine that it has a pretty good foothold. And I don't know if you know what JROTC, everybody knows what that is. Um, I've been in touch with the uh, one in, in my five town district, went in to meet the, uh, the uh, supervisors of the program, and I have this belief that we should be teaching a course in waging peace. So I'm uh, and they actually start, the ROTC program begins in the elementary school, the JROTC. And half of uh, the money comes from our taxes. The other half comes from Chapter 13 through the military. So this is a real fact. I'm not uh, making this up. So the way to begin that, to, you know, to piggyback the process that, uh, that we've been talking about today is to take a look at what's happening in our school systems, both elementary and high school. I've already uh, gone in to have a meeting with the supervisors of the program in my five town district, SAD 55. And um, I'm working on getting inroads in, into, the, into that classroom. They, they average between 40 and 80 students a year. This is especially prevalent in the poor rural towns. Um, and uh, I asked them, well, what, what's the percentage of Kids that you know, students that go through your program end up in the in, in the military. He says it isn't any more than the, the students that go through the high school. That's what he told me. You know, I whether I believe him or not, you know, it's a few questions. He said about twenty percent. 
So what I'd like to do, I know there's a number of speakers here, and people that are working actively in you know, the peace movement and uh, you know, outlawing the war. Uh, what I'd like to do is get a couple of phone numbers of people, because I'm going to try to put together, um, uh, um, have a, I think I should, once I get a working relationship with, with these two people, I'm going to try to put together a, a, a bunch of speakers who can come in and talk about uh, what it is to wage peace. Uh, so they, so the students can have some other thoughts about uh, what they're doing. So I'd love to get a hold of a few phone numbers. With you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's 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 it violates international standards. It's criminal to be recruiting minors, uh, and it goes on all the time. And there are places in this country that have done away with recruiting where there are minors. Uh, we have military uniforms going into kindergartens. We have recruiters in junior high schools. We have video games being uh, produced by the military and uh, video game centers being set up at shopping malls for the military and then shut down by protests. Um, we also have tests in US high schools across this country that are not labeled as military, but are military recruiting tools uh, that in many cases students are required to take. Um, and uh, studentprivacy.org is a great uh, organization working against some of that. Um, and we're creating committees uh, within World Beyond War of people working on counter-recruitment is one committee and every other angle that you can think of. We have a committee set up with people getting involved. So we, if you go to worldbeyondwar.org and you want to do more, then sign a statement. Uh, you can click and let us know where you'd like to get seriously uh, involved. Um, I've been told to, uh, to wrap this up and we can talk informally and I can sign books um, and there's a collection basket uh, going around somewhere um, that you should uh, chip in and I hope some of it will go to future uh, events here in, in Maine. Thank you very much for your questions.